Story 20 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Valiant Little Tailor. One summer's morning, a little tailor was sitting on his table by the window. He was in good spirits and sewed with all his might. Then came a peasant woman down the street crying, Good jams, cheap, good jams, cheap. This rang pleasantly in the tailor's ears. He stretched his delicate head out of the window and called, Come up here, dear woman, here you will get rid of your goods. The woman came up the three steps to the tailor with her heavy basket, and he made her unpack the whole of the pots for him. He inspected all of them, lifted them up, put his nose to them, and at length said, The jam seems to me to be good, so weigh me out four ounces, dear woman, and if it is a quarter of a pound, that is of no consequence. The woman, who had hoped to find a good sale, gave him what he desired, but went away quite angry and grumbling. Now God bless the jam to my use, cried the little tailor, and give me health and strength. So he brought the bread out of the cupboard, cut himself a piece right across the loaf, and spread the jam over it. This won't taste bitter, said he, but I will just finish the jacket before I take a bite. He laid the bread near him, sewed on, and in his joy made bigger and bigger stitches. In the meantime, the smell of the sweet jam ascended so to the wall, where the flies were sitting in great numbers, that they were attracted and descended on it in hosts. Hola, who invited you, said the little tailor, and drove the unbidden guests away. The flies, however, who understood no German, would not be turned away, but came back again in ever-increasing companies. The little tailor at last lost all patience, and got a bit of cloth from the hole under his work-table, and saying, Wait, and I will give it to you, struck it mercilessly on them. When he drew it away and counted, there lay before him no fewer than seven, dead and with legs stretched out. Art thou a fellow of that sort, said he, and could not help admiring his own bravery. The whole town shall know of this. And the little tailor hastened to cut himself a girdle, stitched it and embroidered on it in large letters, seven at one stroke. What the town, he continued, the whole world shall hear of it. And his heart wagged with joy like a lamb's tail. The tailor put on the girdle and resolved to go forth into the world, because he thought his workshop was too small for his valour. Before he went away, he sought about in the house to see if there was anything which he could take with him. However, he found nothing but an old cheese, and that he put in his pocket. In front of the door he observed a bird which had caught itself in the thicket. It had to go into his pocket with the cheese. Now he took to the road boldly, and as he was light and nimble, he felt no fatigue. The road led him up a mountain, and when he had reached the highest point of it, there sat a powerful giant, looking about him quite comfortably. The little tailor went bravely up, spoke to him, and said, "'Good day, comrade. So thou art sitting there overlooking the widespread world? I am just on my way thither, and want to try my luck. Hast thou any inclination to go with me?' The giant looked contemptuously at the tailor, and said, "'Thou ragamuffin!' thou miserable creature. Oh, indeed, answered the little tailor, and unbuttoned his coat and showed the giant the girdle. There mayst thou read what kind of a man I am. The giant read, seven at one stroke, and thought that they had been men whom the tailor had killed, and began to feel a little respect for the tiny fellow. Nevertheless, he wished to try him first, and took a stone in his hand and squeezed it together so that water dripped out of it. Do that likewise, said the giant, if thou hast strength. Is that all, said the tailor? That is child's play with us. And put his hand into his pocket, brought out the soft cheese, and pressed it until the liquid ran out of it. Faith, said he, that was a little better, wasn't it? The giant did not know what to say, and could not believe it of the little man. Then the giant picked up a stone and threw it so high that the eye could scarcely follow it. Now, little mite of a man, do that likewise. Well thrown, said the tailor, but after all the stone came down to earth again. I will throw you one which shall never come back at all. And he put his hand into his pocket, took out the bird, and threw it into the air. 
the bird, delighted with its liberty, rose, flew away, and did not come back. "'How does that shot please you, comrade?' asked the tailor. "'Thou canst certainly throw,' said the giant, "'but now we will see if thou art able to carry anything properly.' He took the little tailor to a mighty oak tree which lay there felled on the ground, and said, If thou art strong enough, help me to carry the tree out of the forest. Readily, answered the little man, Take thou the trunk on thy shoulders, and I will raise up the branches and twigs. After all, they are the heaviest. The giant took the trunk on his shoulder, but the tailor seated himself on a branch, and the giant, who could not look round, had to carry away the whole tree and the little tailor into the bargain. He behind was quite merry and happy, and whistled the song, Three Tailors Rode Forth from the Gate, as if carrying the tree were child's play. The giant, after he had dragged the heavy burden part of the way, could go no further, and cried, Hark you, I shall have to let the tree fall. The tailor sprang nimbly down, seized the tree with both arms as if he had been carrying it, and said to the giant, Thou art such a great fellow, and yet canst not even carry the tree. They went on together, and as they passed a cherry tree, the giant laid hold of the top of the tree where the ripest fruit was hanging, bent it down, gave it into the tailor's hand, and bade him eat. But the little tailor was much too weak to hold the tree, and when the giant let it go, it sprang back again, and the tailor was hurried into the air with it. When he had fallen down again without injury, the giant said, What is this? Hast thou not strength enough to hold the weak twig? There is no lack of strength, answered the little tailor. Dost thou think that could be anything to a man who has struck down seven at one blow? I leapt over the tree, because the huntsmen are shooting down there in the thicket. Jump as I did, if thou canst do it. The giant made the attempt, but could not get over the tree, and remained hanging in the branches, so that in this also the tailor kept the upper hand. The giant said, If thou art such a valiant fellow, come with me into our cavern and spend the night with us. The little tailor was willing, and followed him. When they went into the cave, other giants were sitting there by the fire, and each of them had a roasted sheep in his hand and was eating it. The little tailor looked round and thought, It is much more spacious here than in my workshop. The giant showed him a bed, and said he was to lie down in it and sleep. The bed, however, was too big for the little tailor. He did not lie down in it, but crept into a corner. When it was midnight, and the giant thought that the little tailor was lying in a sound sleep, he got up, took a great iron bar, cut through the bed with one blow, and thought he had given the grasshopper his finishing stroke. With the earliest dawn the giants went into the forest, and had quite forgotten the little tailor, when all at once he walked up to them quite merrily and boldly. The giants were terrified. They were afraid that he would strike them all dead, and ran away in a great hurry. The little tailor went onwards, always following his own pointed nose. After he had walked for a long time, he came to the courtyard of a royal palace, and as he felt weary, he lay down on the grass and fell asleep. Whilst he lay there, the people came and inspected him on all sides, and read on his girdle, seven at one stroke. Ah, said they. What does the great warrior here in the midst of peace? He must be a mighty lord. They went and announced him to the king, and gave it as their opinion that if war should break out, this would be a weighty and useful man who ought on no account to be allowed to depart. The council pleased the king, and he sent one of his courtiers to the little tailor to offer him military service when he awoke. The ambassador remained standing by the sleeper, waited until he stretched his limbs and opened his eyes, and then conveyed to him this proposal. For this very reason have I come here, the tailor replied. I am ready to enter the king's service. He was therefore honorably received, and a special dwelling was assigned him. The soldiers, however, were set against the little tailor, and wished him a thousand miles away. What is to be the end of this, they said amongst themselves. If we quarrel with him, and he strikes about him, seven of us will fall at every blow. Not one of us can stand against him. They came, therefore, to a decision, betook themselves in a body to the king, and begged for their dismissal. We are not prepared, said they, to stay with a man who kills seven at one stroke. The king was sorry that for the sake of one he should lose all his faithful servants, 
wished that he had never set eyes on the tailor, and would willingly have been rid of him again. But he did not venture to give him his dismissal, for he dreaded lest he should strike him and all his people dead and place himself on the royal throne. He thought about it for a long time, and at last found good counsel. He sent to the little tailor and caused him to be informed that, as he was such a great warrior, he had one request to make to him. In a forest of his country lived two giants who caused great mischief with their robbing, murdering, ravaging, and burning, and no one could approach them without putting himself in danger of death. If the tailor conquered and killed these two giants, he would give him his only daughter to wife, and half of his kingdom as a dowry. Likewise, one hundred horsemen should go with him to assist him. That would indeed be a fine thing for a man like me, thought the little tailor. One is not offered a beautiful princess and half a kingdom every day of one's life. Oh, yes, he replied, I will soon subdue the giants, and do not require the help of the hundred horsemen to do it. He who can hit seven with one blow has no need to be afraid of two. The little tailor went forth, and the hundred horsemen followed him. When he came to the outskirts of the forest, he said to his followers, Just stay waiting here. I alone will soon finish off the giants. Then he bounded into the forest and looked about right and left. After a while he perceived both giants. They lay sleeping under a tree and snored so that the branches waved up and down. The little tailor, not idle, gathered two pockets full of stones and with these climbed up the tree. When he was halfway up, he slipped down by a branch until he sat just above the sleepers, and then let one stone after another fall on the breast of one of the giants. For a long time the giant felt nothing, but at last he awoke, pushed his comrade, and said, Why art thou knocking me? Thou must be dreaming, said the other. I am not knocking thee. They laid themselves down to sleep again, and then the tailor threw a stone down on the second. What is the meaning of this? cried the other. Why art thou pelting me? I am not pelting thee, answered the first, growling. They disputed about it for a time, but as they were weary, they let the matter rest, and their eyes closed once more. The little tailor began his game again, picked out the biggest stone, and threw it with all his might on the breast of the first giant. That is too bad, cried he, and sprang up like a madman and pushed his companion against the tree until it shook. The other paid him back in the same coin, and they got into such a rage that they tore up trees and belabored each other so long that at last they both fell down dead on the ground at the same time. Then the little tailor leapt down. It is a lucky thing, said he, that they did not tear up the tree on which I was sitting, or I should have had to spring on to another like a squirrel. But we tailors are nimble. He drew out his sword and gave each of them a couple of thrusts in the breast, and then went out to the horsemen and said, The work is done. I have given both of them their finishing stroke, but it was hard work. They tore up trees in their sore need and defended themselves with them, but all that is to no purpose when a man like myself comes who can kill seven at one blow. But are you not wounded? asked the horseman. You need not concern yourself about that, answered the tailor. They have not bent one hair of mine. The horsemen would not believe him, and rode into the forest. There they found the giants swimming in their blood, and all round about lay the torn-up trees. The little tailor demanded of the king the promised reward. He, however, repented of his promise, and again bethought himself how he could get rid of the hero. Before thou receivest my daughter, and the half of my kingdom, said he to him, thou must perform one more heroic deed. In the forest roams a unicorn, which does great harm, and thou must catch it first. I fear one unicorn still less than two giants. Seven at one blow is my kind of affair. He took a rope and an axe with him, went forth into the forest, and again bade those who were sent with him to wait outside. He had to seek long. The unicorn soon came towards him, and rushed directly on the tailor, as if it would spit him on his horn without more ceremony. Softly, softly, it can't be done as quickly as that, said he, and stood still and waited until the animal was quite close, and then sprang nimbly behind the tree. 
the unicorn ran against the tree with all its strength and struck its horn so fast in the trunk that it had not strength enough to draw it out again and thus it was caught now i have got the bird said the tailor and came out from behind the tree and put the rope around its neck and then with his axe he hewed the horn out of the tree and when all was ready he led the beast away and took it to the king the king still would not give him the promised reward and made a third demand before the wedding the tailor was to catch him a wild boar that made great havoc in the forest and the huntsmen should give him their help willingly said the tailor that is child's play he did not take the huntsmen with him into the forest and they were well pleased that he did not for the wild boar had several times received them in such a manner that they had no inclination to lie in wait for him when the boar perceived the tailor it ran on him with foaming mouth and wetted tusks and was about to throw him to the ground but the active hero sprang into a chapel which was near and up to the window at once and in one bound out again the boar ran in after him but the tailor ran round outside and shut the door behind it and then the raging beast which was much too heavy and awkward to leap out of the window was caught the little tailor called the huntsmen thither that they might see the prisoner with their own eyes the hero however went to the king who was now whether he liked it or not obliged to keep his promise and gave him his daughter and the half of his kingdom had he known that it was no warlike hero but a little tailor who was standing before him it would have gone to his heart still more than it did the wedding was held with great magnificence and small joy and out of a tailor a king was made after some time the young queen heard her husband say in his dreams at night boy make me the doublet and patch the pantaloons or else i will wrap the yard measure over thine ears then she discovered in what state of life the young lord had been born and next morning complained of her wrongs to her father and begged him to help her to get rid of her husband who was nothing else but a tailor the king comforted her and said leave thy bedroom door open this night and my servant shall stand outside and when he has fallen asleep shall go in bind him and take him on board a ship which shall carry him into the wide world the woman was satisfied with this but the king's armor-bearer who had heard all was friendly with the young lord and informed him of the whole plot i'll put a screw into that business said the little tailor at night he went to bed with his wife at the usual time and when she thought that he had fallen asleep she got up opened the door and then lay down again the little tailor who was only pretending to be asleep began to cry out in a clear voice boy make me the doublet and patch me the pantaloons or i will wrap the yard measure over thine ears i smote seven at one blow i killed two giants i brought away one unicorn and caught a wild boar and am i to fear those who are standing outside the room when these men heard the tailor speaking thus they were overcome by a great dread and ran as if the wild huntsmen were behind them and none of them would venture anything further against him so the little tailor was a king and remained one to the end of his life end of story 20「21 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vittoria Khan. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Cinderella. The wife of a rich man fell sick and as she felt that her end was drawing near she called her only daughter to her bedside and said dear child be good and pious and then the good god will always protect thee and i will look down on thee from heaven and be near thee thereupon she closed her eyes and departed Every day the maiden went out to her mother's grave and wept, and she remained pious and good. When winter came the snow spread a white sheet over the grave, and when the spring sun had drawn it off again, the man had taken another wife. 
the woman had brought two daughters into the house with her, who were beautiful and fair of face, but vile and black of heart. Now began a bad time for the poor stepchild. "'Is the stupid goose to sit in the parlour with us?' said they. "'He who wants to eat bread must earn it. Out with the kitchen wench!' They took her pretty clothes away from her, put an old grey bedgown on her, and gave her wooden shoes. "'Ha! <laughs> Just look at the proud princess! How decked out she is!' they cried and laughed, and led her into the kitchen. There she had to do hard work from morning till night, get up before daybreak, carry water, light fires, cook and wash. Besides this, the sisters did her every imaginable injury. They mocked her, and emptied her peas and lentils into the ashes, so that she was forced to sit and pick them out again. In the evening, when she had worked till she was weary, she had no bed to go to, but had to sleep by the fireside in the ashes. And as on that account she always looked dusty and dirty, they called her Cinderella. It happened that the father was once going to the fair, and he asked his two stepdaughters what he should bring back for them. "'Beautiful dresses,' said one. "'Pearls and jewels,' said the second. "'And thou, Cinderella,' said he, "'what wilt thou have?' "'Father, break off for me the first branch which knocks against your hat on your way home.' So he bought beautiful dresses, pearls, and jewels for his two stepdaughters, and on his way home, as he was riding through a green thicket, a hazel twig brushed against him and knocked off his hat. Then he broke off the branch and took it with him. When he reached home he gave his stepdaughters the things which they had wished for, and to Cinderella he gave the branch from the hazel bush. Cinderella thanked him, went to her mother's grave, and planted the branch on it, and wept so much that the tears fell down on it and watered it. And it grew, however, and became a handsome tree. Thrice a day Cinderella went and sat beneath it, and wept and prayed, and a little white bird always came on the tree, and if Cinderella expressed a wish, the bird threw down to her what she had wished for. It happened, however, that the king appointed a festival which was to last three days, and to which all the beautiful young girls in the country were invited, in order that his son might choose himself a bride. When the two stepsisters heard that they too were to appear among the number, they were delighted, called Cinderella, and said, "'Comb our hair for us, brush our shoes, and fasten our buckles, for we are going to the festival at the king's palace.' Cinderella obeyed, but wept, because she too would have liked to go with them to the dance, and begged her stepmother to allow her to do so. "'Thou go, Cinderella,' said she. "'Thou art dusty and dirty, and wouldst go to the festival? Thou hast no clothes and shoes, and yet wouldst dance.' As, however, Cinderella went on asking, the stepmother at last said, I have emptied a dish of lentils into the ashes for thee. If thou hast picked them out again in two hours, thou shalt go with us. The maiden went through the back door into the garden and called, You tame pigeons, you turtle doves, and all you birds beneath the sky, come and help me to pick the good into the pot, the bad into the crop. Then two white pigeons came in by the kitchen window, and afterwards the turtle doves, and at last all the birds beneath the sky came whirring and crowding in, and alighted amongst the ashes. And the pigeons nodded with their heads and began pick, 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 and the rest began also pick, 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 and gathered all the good grains into the dish. Hardly had one hour passed before they had finished, and all flew out again. Then the girl took the dish to her stepmother and was glad, and believed that now she would be allowed to go with them to the festival. But the stepmother said, No, Cinderella, thou hast no clothes, and thou canst not dance. Thou wouldst only be laughed at. 
and as Cinderella wept at this, the stepmother said, oh, If thou canst pick two dishes of lentils out of the ashes for me in one hour, thou shalt go with us. And she thought to herself, That she most certainly cannot do. When the stepmother had emptied the two dishes of lentils amongst the ashes, the maiden went through the back door into the garden and cried, You tame pigeons, you turtle doves, and all you birds under heaven, come and help me to pick the good into the pot, the bad into the crop. Then two white pigeons came in by the kitchen window, and afterwards the turtle doves, and at length all the birds beneath the sky came whirring and crowding in, and alighted amongst the ashes. And the doves nodded with their heads and began, pick, 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 and the others began also, pick, 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 and gathered all the good seeds into the dishes. And before half an hour was over, they had already finished, and all flew out again. Then the maiden carried the dishes to the stepmother and was delighted and believed that she might now go with them to the festival. But the stepmother said, All this will not help thee. Thou goest not with us, for thou hast no clothes and canst not dance. We should be ashamed of thee. On this she turned her back on Cinderella and hurried away with her two proud daughters. As no one was now at home, Cinderella went to her mother's grave beneath the hazel tree and cried, Shiver and quiver, little tree, silver and gold, throw down over me. Then the bird threw a gold and silver dress down to her, and slippers embroidered with silk and silver. She put on the dress with all speed and went to the festival. Her stepsisters and the stepmother, however, did not know her, and thought she must be a foreign princess, for she looked so beautiful in the golden dress. They never once thought of Cinderella, and believed that she was sitting at home in the dirt, picking lentils out of the ashes. The prince went to meet her, took her by the hand, and danced with her. He would dance with no other maiden, and never left loose of her hand and if any one else came to invite her, he said, This is my partner. She danced till it was evening, and then she wanted to go home. But the king's son said, I will go with thee and bear thee company, for he wished to see to whom the beautiful maiden belonged. She escaped from him, however, and sprang into the pigeon house. The king's son waited until her father came, and then he told him that the stranger maiden had leapt into the pigeon house. The old man thought, Can it be Cinderella? And they had to bring him an axe and a pickaxe that he might hew the pigeon house to pieces, but no one was inside it. And when they got home, Cinderella lay in her dirty clothes among the ashes, and a dim little oil lamp was burning on the mantelpiece. For Cinderella had jumped quickly down from the back of the pigeon house and had run to the little hazel tree, and there she had taken off her beautiful clothes and laid them on the grave, and the bird had taken them away again, and then she had placed herself in the kitchen amongst the ashes in her gray gown. Next day, when the festival began afresh and her parents and stepsisters had gone once more, Cinderella went to the hazel tree and said, shiver and quiver my little tree silver and gold throw down over me then the bird threw down a much more beautiful dress than on the preceding day and when cinderella appeared at the festival in this dress every one was astonished at her beauty the king's son had waited until she came and instantly took her by the hand and danced with no one but her when others came and invited her he said she is my partner when evening came she wished to leave and the king's son followed her and wanted to see into which house she went but she sprang away from him and into the garden behind the house therein stood a beautiful tall tree on which hung the most magnificent pears she clambered so nimbly between the branches like a squirrel that the king's son did not know where she was gone he waited until her father came and said to him, The stranger maiden has escaped from me, and I believe she has climbed up the pear tree. The father thought, 
can it be cinderella and had an axe brought and cut the tree down but no one was on it and when they got into the kitchen cinderella lay there amongst the ashes as usual for she had jumped down on the other side of the tree had taken the beautiful dress to the bird on the little hazel tree and put on her gray gown on the third day when the parents and sisters had gone away cinderella went once more to her mother's grave and said to the little tree shiver and quiver my little tree silver and gold throw down over me and now the bird threw down to her a dress which was more splendid and magnificent than any she had yet had and the slippers were golden and when she went to the festival in the dress no one knew how to speak for astonishment the king's son danced with her only and if any one invited her to dance he said she is my partner when evening came cinderella wished to leave and the king's son was anxious to go with her but she escaped from him so quickly that he could not follow her the king's son had however used a stratagem and had caused the whole staircase to be smeared with pitch and there when she ran down had the maiden's left slipper remained sticking the king's son picked it up and it was small and dainty and all golden next morning he went with it to the father and said to him no one shall be my wife but she whose foot this golden slipper fits then were the two sisters glad for they had pretty feet the eldest went with the shoe into her room and wanted to try it on and her mother stood by but she could not get her big toe into it and the shoe was too small for her then her mother gave her a knife and said cut the toe off when thou art queen thou wilt have no more need to go on foot the maiden cut the toe off forced the foot into the shoe swallowed the pain and went out to the king's son then he took her on his horse as his bride and rode away with her they were however obliged to pass the grave and there on the hazel tree sat the two pigeons and cried turn and peep turn and peep there's blood within the shoe the shoe it is too small for her the true bride waits for you then he looked at her foot and saw how the blood was streaming from it he turned his horse round and took the false bride home again and said she was not the true one and that the other sister was to put the shoe on then this one went into her chamber and got her toes safely into the shoe but her heel was too large so her mother gave her a knife and said cut a bit off thy heel when thou art queen thou wilt have no more need to go on foot the maiden cut a bit off her heel forced her foot into the shoe swallowed the pain and went out to the king's son he took her on his horse as his bride and rode away with her but when they passed by the hazel tree two little pigeons sat on it and cried turn and peep turn and peep there's blood within the shoe the shoe it is too small for her the true bride waits for you he looked down at her foot and saw how the blood was running out of her shoe and how it had stained her white stocking then he turned his horse and took the false bride home again this also is not the right one said he have you no other daughter no said the man there is still a little stunted kitchen wench which my late wife left behind her but she cannot possibly be the bride the king's son said he was to send her up to him but the mother answered oh no she is much too dirty she cannot show herself he absolutely insisted on it and cinderella had to be called she first washed her hands and face clean and then went and bowed down before the king's son who gave her the golden shoe then she seated herself on a stool drew her foot out of the heavy wooden shoe and put it into the slipper which fitted like a glove and when she rose up and the king's son looked at her face he recognized the beautiful maiden who had danced with him and cried that is the true bride 
the stepmother and the two sisters were terrified and became pale with rage he however took cinderella on his horse and rode away with her as they passed by the hazel tree the two white doves cried turn and peep turn and peep no blood is in the shoe the shoe is not too small for her the true bride rides with you and when they had cried that the two came flying down and placed themselves on cinderella's shoulders one on the right the other on the left and remained sitting there when the wedding with the king's son had to be celebrated the two false sisters came and wanted to get into favor with cinderella and share her good fortune when the betrothed couple went to church the elder was at the right side and the younger at the left and the pigeons pecked out one eye of each of them afterwards as they came back the elder was at the left and the younger at the right and then the pigeons pecked out the other eye of each and thus for their wickedness and falsehood they were punished with blindness as long as they lived end of story 21「Story 22 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonja Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Riddle There was once a king's son who was seized with a desire to travel about the world and took no one with him but a faithful servant one day he came to a great forest and when darkness overtook him he could find no shelter and knew not where to pass the night then he saw a girl who was going towards a small house and when he came nearer he saw that the maiden was young and beautiful he spoke to her and said dear child can i and my servant find shelter for the night in the little house oh yes said the girl in a sad voice that you certainly can but i do not advise you to venture it do not go in why not asked the king's son the maiden sighed and said my stepmother practices wicked arts she is ill disposed towards strangers then he saw very well that he had come to the house of a witch but as it was dark and he could go no farther and also was not afraid he entered the old woman was sitting in an armchair by the fire and looked at the stranger with her red eyes good evening growled she and pretended to be quite friendly take a seat and rest yourselves she blew up the fire on which she was cooking something in a small pot the daughter warned the two to be prudent to eat nothing and drink nothing for the old woman brewed evil drinks they slept quietly until early morning when they were making ready for their departure and the king's son was already seated on his horse the old woman said stop a moment i will first hand you a parting draught whilst she fetched it the king's son rode away and the servant who had to buckle his saddle tight was the only one present when the wicked witch came with the drink take that to your master said she but at that instant the glass broke and the poison spurted on the horse and it was so strong that the animal immediately fell down dead the servant ran after his master and told him what had happened but would not leave his saddle behind him and ran back to fetch it when however he came to the dead horse a raven was already sitting on it devouring it who knows whether we shall find anything better to-day said the servant so he killed the raven and took it with him and now they journeyed onwards into the forest the whole day but could not get out of it by nightfall they found an inn and entered it the servant gave the raven to the innkeeper to make ready for supper they had however stumbled on a den of murderers and during the darkness twelve of these came intending to kill the strangers and rob them before they set about this work they sat down to supper and the innkeeper and the witch sat down with them and together they ate a dish of soup in which was cut up the flesh of the raven hardly however had they swallowed a couple of mouthfuls before they all fell down dead 
for the raven had communicated to them the poison from the horse flesh there was no one else left in the house but the innkeeper's daughter who was honest and had taken no part in their godless deeds she opened all doors to the stranger and showed him the heaped-up treasures but the king's son said she might keep everything he would have none of it and rode onwards with his servant after they had travelled about for a long time they came to a town in which was a beautiful but proud princess who had caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever should set her a riddle which she could not guess that man should be her husband but if she guessed it his head must be cut off she had three days to guess it in but was so clever that she always found the answer to the riddle given her before the appointed time nine suitors had already perished in this manner when the king's son arrived and blinded by her great beauty was willing to stake his life for it then he went to her and laid his riddle before her what is this said he one slew none and yet slew twelve she did not know what that was she thought and thought but she could not find out she opened her riddle books but it was not in them in short her wisdom was at an end as she did not know how to help herself she ordered her maid to creep into the lord's sleeping chamber and listen to his dreams and thought that he would perhaps speak in his sleep and discover the riddle but the clever servant had placed himself in the bed instead of his master and when the maid came there he tore off from her the mantle in which she had wrapped herself and chased her out with rods the second night the king's daughter sent her maid in waiting who was to see if she could succeed better in listening but the servant took her mantle also away from her and hunted her out with rods now the master believed himself safe for the third night and lay down in his own bed then came the princess herself and she had put on a misty grey mantle and she seated herself near him and when she thought that he was asleep and dreaming she spoke to him and hoped that he would answer in his sleep as many do but he was awake and understood and heard everything quite well then she asked one slew none what is that he replied a raven which ate of a dead and poisoned horse and died of it she inquired further and yet slew twelve what is that he answered that means twelve murderers who ate the raven and died of it when she knew the answer to the riddle she wanted to steal away but he held her mantle so fast that she was forced to leave it behind her next morning the king's daughter announced that she had guessed the riddle and sent for the twelve judges and expounded it before them but the youth begged for a hearing and said she stole into my room in the night and questioned me otherwise she could not have discovered it the judges said bring us a proof of this then were the three mantles brought thither by the servant and when the judges saw the misty grey one which the king's daughter usually wore they said let the mantle be embroidered with gold and silver and then it will be your wedding mantle end of story twenty two Story 23 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Recording by Bob Siebold. The Mouse, the Bird, and the Sausage once on a time a mouse a bird and a sausage became companions kept house together lived well and happily with each other and wonderfully increased their possessions the bird's work was to fly every day into the forest and bring back wood the mouse had to carry water light the fire and lay the table but the sausage had to cook he who is too well off is always longing for something new one day therefore the bird met with another bird on the way to whom it related its excellent circumstances and boasted of them the other bird however called it a poor simpleton for his hard work but said that the two at home had good times for when the mouse had made her fire and carried her water 
she went into her little room to rest until they called her to lay the table the sausage stayed by the pot saw that the food was cooking well and when it was nearly time for dinner it rolled itself once or twice through the broth or vegetables and then they were buttered salted and ready when the bird came home and laid his burden down they sat down to dinner and after they had had their meal they slept their fill till next morning and that was a splendid life next day the bird prompted by the other bird would go no more into the wood saying that he had been servant long enough and had been made a fool of by them and that they must change about for once and try to arrange it in another way and though the mouse and the sausage also begged most earnestly the bird would have his way and said it must be tried they cast lots about it and the lot fell on the sausage who was to carry wood the mouse became cook and the bird was to fetch water what happened the little sausage went out towards the wood the little bird lighted the fire the mouse stayed by the pot and waited alone until little sausage came home and brought wood for next day but the little sausage stayed so long on the road that they both feared something was amiss and the bird flew out a little way in the air to meet it not far off however it met a dog on the road who had fallen on the poor sausage as lawful booty and had seized and swallowed it the bird charged the dog with an act of barefaced robbery but it was in vain to speak for the dog said he had found forged papers on the sausage on which account its life was forfeited to him the bird sadly took up the wood flew home and related what he had seen and heard they were much troubled but agreed to do their best and remain together the bird therefore laid the cloth and the mouse made ready the food and wanted to dress it and to get into the pot as the sausage used to do and roll and creep amongst the vegetables to mix them but before she got into the midst of them she was stopped and lost her skin and hair and life in the attempt when the bird came to carry up the dinner no cook was there in its distress the bird threw the wood here and there called and searched but no cook was found owing to his carelessness the wood caught fire so that a conflagration ensued the bird hastened to fetch water and then the bucket dropped from his claws into the well and he fell down with it and could not recover himself and had to drown there End of story 23。story 24 of household tales。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by rock tie。household tales。by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt mother holle there was once a widow who had two daughters one of whom was pretty and industrious whilst the other was ugly and idle but she was much fonder of the ugly and idle one because she was her own daughter and the other who was a stepdaughter was obliged to do all the work and be the cinderella of the house every day the poor girl had to sit by a well in the highway and spin and spin till her fingers bled now it happened that one day the shuttle was marked with her blood so she dipped it in the well to wash the mark off but it dropped out of her hand and fell to the bottom she began to weep and ran to her stepmother and told her of the mishap but she scolded her sharply and was so merciless as to say since you have let the shuttle fall in you must fetch it out again so the girl went back to the well and did not know what to do and in the sorrow of her heart she jumped into the well to get the shuttle she lost her senses and when she awoke and came to herself again she was in a lovely meadow where the sun was shining and many thousands of flowers were growing along this meadow she went and at last came to a baker's oven full of bread and the bread cried out oh take me out take me out or i shall burn i have been baked a long time so she went up to it and took out all the loaves one after another with a bread shovel after that she went on till she came to a tree covered with apples which called out to her oh shake me shake me we apples are all ripe so she shook the tree till the apples fell like rain and went on shaking till they were all down and when she had gathered them into a heap 
she went on her way. At last she came to a little house, out of which an old woman peeped, but she had such large teeth that the girl was frightened and was about to run away. But the old woman called out to her, What are you afraid of, dear child? Stay with me. If you will do all the work in the house properly, you shall be the better for it. Only you must take care to make my bed well and shake it thoroughly till the feathers fly, for then there is snow on the earth. I am Mother Holle. As the old woman spoke so kindly to her, the girl took courage and agreed to enter her service. She attended to everything to the satisfaction of her mistress, and always shook her bed so vigorously that the feathers flew about like snowflakes. So she had a pleasant life with her, never an angry word, and boiled or roast meat every day. She stayed some time with Mother Holle, and then she became sad. At first she did not know what was the matter with her, but found at length that it was homesickness. Although she was many thousand times better off here than at home, still she had a longing to be there. At last she said to the old woman, I have a longing for home, and however well off I am down here, I cannot stay any longer. I must go up again to my own people. Mother Holle said, I am pleased that you long for your home again, and as you have served me so truly, I myself will take you up again. Thereupon she took her by the hand and led her to a large door. The door was opened, and just as the maiden was standing beneath the doorway, a heavy shower of golden rain fell, and all the gold remained sticking to her, so that she was completely covered over with it. "'You shall have that, because you have been so industrious,' said Mother Holle, and at the same time she gave her back the shuttle which she had let fall into the well. Thereupon the door closed, and the maiden found herself up above upon the earth, not far from her mother's house. As she went into the yard, the cock was standing by the well-side and cried, cock a doo your golden girls come back to you. So she went in to her mother, and as she arrived thus covered with gold, she was well received both by her and her sister. The girl told all that had happened to her, and as soon as the mother heard how she had come by so much wealth, she was very anxious to obtain the same good luck for the ugly and lazy daughter. She had to seat herself by the well and spin, and in order that her shuttle might be stained with blood, she stuck her hand into a thorn bush and pricked her finger. Then she threw the shuttle into the well and jumped in after it. She came, like the other, to the beautiful meadow and walked along the very same path. When she got to the oven, the bread again cried, Oh, take me out, take me out, or I shall burn. I have been baked a long time. But the lazy thing answered, As if I had any wish to make myself dirty, and on she went. Soon she came to the apple tree, which cried, Oh, shake me, shake me, we apples are all ripe. But she answered, Ah, like that, one of you might fall on my head. And so went on. When she came to Mother Holle's house, she was not afraid, for she had already heard of her big teeth, and she hired herself to her immediately. The first day she forced herself to work diligently and obeyed Mother Holle when she told her to do anything, for she was thinking of all the gold that she would give her. But on the second day she began to be lazy, and on the third day still more so, and then she would not get up in the morning at all. Neither did she make Mother Holle's bed as she ought, and did not shake it so as to make the feathers fly up. Mother Holle was soon tired of this and gave her notice to leave. The lazy girl was willing enough to go and thought that now the golden rain would come. Mother Holle led her also to the great door, but while she was standing beneath it, instead of the gold, a big kettle full of pitch was emptied over her. 
That is the reward for your service, said Mother Holle, and shut the door. So the lazy girl went home, but she was quite covered with pitch, and the cock by the well side, as soon as he saw her, cried out, cock a doodle -doo! your pitchy girls come back to you but the pitch stuck fast to her and could not be got off as long as she lived end of story twenty four story number twenty five of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Household Tales by Jacob and William Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Seven Ravens. There was once a man who had seven sons, and still he had no daughter, however much he wished for one. At length his wife again gave him hope of a child and when it came into the world it was a girl the joy was great but the child was sickly and small and had to be privately baptized on account of its weakness the father sent one of the boys in haste to the spring to fetch water for the baptism the other six went with him and as each of them wanted to be first to fill it the jug fell into the well there they stood and did not know what to do and none of them dared to go home as they still did not return the father grew impatient and said they have certainly forgotten it for some game the wicked boys he became afraid that the girl would have to die without being baptized and in his anger cried i wish the boys were all turned into ravens hardly was the word spoken before he heard a whirring of wings over his head in the air looked up and saw seven coal-black ravens flying away the parents could not recall the curse and however sad they were at the loss of their seven sons they still to some extent comforted themselves with their dear little daughter who soon grew strong and every day became more beautiful for a long time she did not know that she had had brothers for her parents were careful not to mention them before her but one day she accidentally heard some people saying of herself that the girl was certainly beautiful but that in reality she was to blame for the misfortune which had befallen her seven brothers then she was much troubled and went to her father and mother and asked if it was true that she had had brothers and what had become of them the parents now dared keep the secret no longer but said that what had befallen her brothers was the will of heaven and that her birth had only been the innocent cause but the maiden took it to heart daily and thought she must deliver her brothers she had no rest or peace until she set out secretly and went forth into the wide world to trace out her brothers and set them free let it cost what it might she took nothing with her but a little ring belonging to her parents as a keepsake a loaf of bread against hunger a little pitcher of water against thirst and a little chair as a provision against weariness and now she went continually onwards far far to the very end of the world then she came to the sun but it was too hot and terrible and devoured little children hastily she ran away and ran to the moon but it was far too cold and also awful and malicious and when it saw the child it said i smell i smell the flesh of men on this she ran swiftly away and came to the stars which were kind and good to her each of them sat on its own particular little chair but the morning star arose and gave her the drumstick of a chicken and said if you thou hast not that drumstick thou canst not open the glass mountain and in the glass mountain are thy brothers the maiden took the drumstick wrapped it carefully in a cloth and went onwards again until she came to the glass mountain the door was shut and she thought she would take out the drumstick but when she undid the cloth it was empty and she had lost the good stars as present what was she now to do she wished to rescue her brothers and had no key to the glass mountain the good sister took a knife cut off one of her little fingers put it in the door and succeeded in opening it when she had gone inside a little dwarf came to meet her and said my child what are you looking for i'm looking for my brothers the seven ravens she replied the dwarf said the lord ravens are not at home but if you will wait here until they come step in thereupon the little dwarf carried the ravens's dinner in on seven little plates 
and in seven little glasses and the little sister ate a morsel from each plate and from each little glass she took a sip but in the last little glass she dropped the ring which she had brought away with her suddenly she heard a whirring of wings and rushing through the air and then the little dwarf said now the lord ravens are flying home then they came and wanted to eat and drink and looked for their little plates and glasses then said one after the other who has eaten something from my plate who has drunk out of my little glass it was a human mouth and when the seventh came to the bottom of the glass the ring rolled against his mouth then he looked at it and saw that it was a ring belonging to his father and mother and said god grant that our sister may be here and then we shall be free when the maiden who was standing behind the door watching heard that wish she came forth and on this all the ravens were restored to their human form again and they embraced and kissed each other and went joyfully home end of section number twenty five Story twenty six of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Little Red Cap. Once upon a time, there was a dear little girl who was loved by everyone who looked at her, but most of all by her grandmother, and there was nothing that she would not have given to the child once she gave her a little cap of red velvet which suited her so well that she would never wear anything else so she was always called little red cap one day her mother said to her come little red cap here is a piece of cake and a bottle of wine take them to your grandmother she is ill and weak and they will do her good set out before it gets hot and when you are going walk nicely and quietly and do not run off the path or you may fall and break the bottle, and then your grandmother will get nothing. And when you go into her room, don't forget to say, Good morning, and don't peep into every corner before you do it. I will take great care, said Little Red Cap to her mother, and gave her hand on it. The grandmother lived out in the wood, half a league from the village, and just as Little Red Cap entered the wood, a wolf met her. Red Cap did not know what a wicked creature he was, and was not at all afraid of him good day little red cap said he thank you kindly wolf whither away so early little red cap to my grandmother's what have you got in your apron cake and wine yesterday was baking day so poor sick grandmother is to have something good to make her stronger where does your grandmother live little red cap a good quarter of a league farther on in the wood her house stands under the three large oak trees, and nut trees are just below. You surely must know it, replied Little Red Cap. The wolf thought to himself, What a tender young creature! What a nice plump mouthful! She will be better to eat than the old woman. I must act craftily, so as to catch both. So he walked for a short time by the side of Little Red Cap, and then he said, See, Little Red Cap, how pretty the flowers are about here? why do you not look round i believe too that you do not hear how sweetly the little birds are singing you walk gravely along as if you were going to school while everything else out here in the wood is merry little red cap raised her eyes and when she saw the sunbeams dancing here and there through the trees and pretty flowers growing everywhere she thought suppose i take grandmother a fresh nosegay that would please her too it is so early in the day that I shall still get there in good time. And so she ran from the path into the wood to look for flowers, and whenever she had picked one, she fancied that she saw a still prettier one farther on, and ran after it, and so got deeper and deeper into the wood. Meanwhile, the wolf ran straight to the grandmother's house and knocked at the door. Who's there? Little Red Cap, replied the wolf. She is bringing cake and wine. Open the door lift the latch called out the grandmother i am too weak and cannot get up the wolf lifted the latch the door flew open and without saying a word he went straight to the grandmother's bed and devoured her then he put on her clothes dressed himself in her cap and laid himself in bed and drew the curtains little red cap however had been running about picking flowers and when she had gathered so many that she could carry no more 
she remembered her grandmother and set out on the way to her. She was surprised to find the cottage door standing open, and when she went into the room, she had such a strange feeling that she said to herself, Oh dear, how uneasy I feel today, and at other times I like being with grandmother so much. She called out, Good morning, but received no answer, so she went to the bed and drew back the curtains. There lay her grandmother, with her cap pulled far over her face and looking very strange. Oh, grandmother, she said, what big ears you have. The better to hear you with, my child, was the reply. But, grandmother, what big eyes you have, she said. The better to see you with, my dear. But, grandmother, what large hands you have. The better to hug you with. Oh, but, grandmother, what a terrible big mouth you have. The better to eat you with. And scarcely had the wolf said this, than with one bound he was out of bed and swallowed up Redcap. When the wolf had appeased his appetite, he laid down again in the bed fell asleep and began to snore very loud. The huntsman was just passing the house and thought to himself, How the old woman is snoring! I must just see if she wants anything. So he went into the room, and when he came to the bed, he saw that the wolf was lying in it. Do I find thee here, thou old sinner? said he. I have long sought thee. Then just as he was going to fire at him, it occurred to him that the wolf might have devoured the grandmother and that she might still be saved. So he did not fire, but took a pair of scissors, and began to cut open the stomach of the sleeping wolf. When he had made two snips, he saw the little red cap shining, and then he made two snips more, and the little girl sprang out, crying, Ah, oh, how frightened I have been! How dark it was inside the wolf! And after that, the aged grandmother came out alive also, but scarcely able to breathe. Red cap, however, quickly fetched great stones, with which they filled the wolf's body, and when he awoke, he wanted to run away, but the stones were so heavy that he fell down at once, and fell dead. Then all three were delighted. The huntsman drew off the wolf's skin and went home with it. The grandmother ate the cake and drank the wine, which Redcap had brought, and revived. But Redcap thought to herself, As long as I live, I will never by myself leave the path to run into the wood when my mother has forbidden me to do so. It was also related that once, when Redcap was again taking cakes to the old grandmother, another wolf spoke to her and tried to entice her from the path. Redcap, however, was on her guard and went straight forward on her way and told her grandmother that she had met the wolf and that he had said good morning to her, but with such a wicked look in his eyes that if they had not been on the public road, she was certain he would have eaten her up. Well, said the grandmother, we will shut the door, that he may not come in. Soon afterwards the wolf knocked, and cried, Open the door, grandmother. I am Little Redcap, and am fetching you some cakes. But they did not speak, or open the door, so the grey beard stole twice or thrice round the house, and at last jumped on the roof, intending to wait until Redcap went home in the evening, and then to steal after her and devour her in the darkness. But the grandmother saw what was in his thoughts, in front of the house was a great stone trough. So she said to the child, Take the pail, red cap. I made some sausages yesterday, so carry the water in which I boiled them to the trough. Red cap carried until the great trough was quite full. Then the smell of the sausages reached the wolf, and he sniffed and peeped down, and at last stretched out his neck so far that he could no longer keep his footing and began to slip and slipped down from the roof straight into the great trough, and was drowned. But Redcap went joyously home, and never did anything to harm anyone. End of Story 26。Story 27 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rocktie. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Bremen Town Musicians. A certain man had a donkey, which had carried the corn sacks to the mill indefatigably for many a long year. But his strength was going 
and he was growing more and more unfit for work. Then his master began to consider how he might best save his keep, but the donkey, seeing that no good wind was blowing, ran away and set out on the road to Bremen. There, he thought, I can surely be a town musician. When he had walked some distance, he found a hound lying on the road, gasping like one who had run till he was tired. What are you gasping so for, you big fellow? asked the donkey. Ah, replied the hound, as I am old and daily grow weaker and no longer can hunt, my master wanted to kill me, so I took to flight. But now how am I to earn my bread? I tell you what, said the donkey, I am going to Bremen and shall be town musician there. Go with me and engage yourself also as a musician. I will play the lute, and you shall beat the kettle drum." The hound agreed, and on they went. Before long they came to a cat, sitting on the path with a face like three rainy days. "'Now then, old shaver, what has gone askew with you?' asked the donkey. "'Who can be merry when his neck is in danger?' answered the cat. "'Because I am now getting old, and my teeth are worn to stumps and I prefer to sit by the fire and spin, rather than hunt about after mice. My mistress wanted to drown me, so I ran away. But now good advice is scarce. Where am I to go? Go with us to Bremen. You understand night music. You can be a town musician. The cat thought well of it, and went with them. After this the three fugitives came to a farmyard, where the cock was sitting upon the gate crowing with all his might. "'Your crow goes through and through one,' said the donkey. "'What is the matter?' "'I have been foretelling fine weather, because it is the day on which Our Lady washes the Christ child's little shirts and wants to dry them,' said the cock. "'But guests are coming for Sunday, so the housewife has no pity and has told the cook that she intends to eat me in the soup tomorrow and this evening.' I am to have my head cut off. Now I am crowing at full pitch while I can. Ah, but Redcomb, said the donkey, you had better come away with us. We are going to Bremen. You can find something better than death everywhere. You have a good voice, and if we make music together, it must have some quality. The cock agreed to this plan, and all four went on together. They could not, however, reached the city of Bremen in one day, and in the evening they came to a forest where they meant to pass the night. The donkey and the hound laid themselves down under a large tree. The cat and the cock settled themselves in the branches, but the cock flew right to the top where he was most safe. Before he went to sleep he looked round on all four sides and thought he saw in the distance a little spark burning. So he called out to his companions that there must be a house not far off, for he saw a light. The donkey said, If so, we had better get up and go on, for the shelter here is bad. The hound thought that a few bones with some meat on would do him good too. So they made their way to the place where the light was, and soon saw it shine brighter and grow larger, until they came to a well-lighted robber's house. The donkey, as the biggest, went to the window and looked in. "'What do you see, my grey horse?' asked the cock. "'What do I see?' answered the donkey. "'A table covered with good things to eat and drink, and robbers sitting at it enjoying themselves.' "'That would be the sort of thing for us,' said the cock. "'Yes, yes. Ah, how I wish we were there,' said the donkey. Then the animals took counsel together how they should manage to drive away the robbers, and at last they thought of a plan. The donkey was to place himself with his four feet upon the window ledge, the hound was to jump on the donkey's back, the cat was to climb upon the dog, and lastly the cock was to fly up and perch upon the head of the cat. When this was done, at a given signal, they began to perform their music together. The donkey brayed, the hound barked, the cat mewed, and the cock crowed. 
then they burst through the window into the room so that the glass clattered at this horrible din the robber sprang up thinking no otherwise than that a ghost had come in and fled in a great fright out into the forest the four companions now sat down at the table well content with what was left and ate as if they were going to fast for a month as soon as the four minstrels had done they put out the light and each thought for himself a sleeping place according to his nature and to what suited him the donkey laid himself down upon some straw in the yard the hound behind the door the cat upon the hearth near the warm ashes and the cock perched himself upon a beam on the roof and being tired from their long walk they soon went to sleep when it was past midnight and the robbers saw from afar that the light was no longer burning in their house and all appeared quiet the captain said we ought not to have let ourselves be frightened out of our wits and ordered one of them to go and examine the house the messenger finding all still went into the kitchen to light a candle and taking the glistening fiery eyes of the cat for live coals he held a lucifer match to them to light it but the cat did not understand the joke and flew in his face spitting and scratching he was dreadfully frightened and ran to the back door but the dog who lay there sprang up and bit his leg and as he ran across the yard by the straw heap the donkey gave him a smart kick with its hind foot the cock too who had been awakened by the noise and had become lively cried down from the beam cock -a -doodle -doo! then the robber ran back as fast as he could to his captain and said ah oh, there is a horrible witch sitting in the house who spat on me and scratched my face with her long claws and by the door stands a man with a knife who stabbed me in the leg and in the yard there lies a black monster who beat me with a wooden club and above upon the roof sits the judge who called out bring the rogue here to me so i got away as well as i could after this the robbers did not trust themselves in the house again but it suited the four musicians of bremen so well that they did not care to leave it any more and the mouth of him who last told this story is still warm end of story twenty seven Story twenty eight of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Singing Bone. In a certain country, there was once great lamentation over a wild boar that laid waste the farmer's fields killed the cattle and ripped up people's bodies with his tusks the king promised a large reward to any one who would free the land from this plague but the beast was so big and strong that no one dared to go near the forest in which it lived at last the king gave notice that whosoever should capture or kill the wild boar should have his only daughter to wife now there lived in the country two brothers sons of a poor man who declared themselves willing to undertake the hazardous enterprise the elder who was crafty and shrewd out of pride the younger who was innocent and simple from a kind heart the king said in order that you may be the more sure of finding the beast you must go into the forest from opposite sides so the elder went in on the west side and the younger on the east when the younger had gone a short way a little man stepped up to him he held in his hand a black spear and said i give you this spear because your heart is pure and good with this you can boldly attack the wild boar and it will do you no harm he thanked the little man shouldered the spear and went on fearlessly before long he saw the beast which rushed at him but he held the spear towards it and in its blind fury it ran so swiftly against it that its heart was cloven in twain then he took the monster on his back and went homewards with it to the king 
as he came out at the other side of the wood there stood at the entrance a house where people were making merry with wine and dancing his elder brother had gone in here and thinking that after all the boar would not run away from him was going to drink until he felt brave but when he saw his young brother coming out of the wood laden with his booty his envious evil heart gave him no peace he called out to him come in dear brother rest and refresh yourself with a cup of wine the youth who suspected no evil went in and told him about the good little man who had given him the spear wherewith he had slain the boar the elder brother kept him there until the evening and then they went away together and when in the darkness they came to a bridge over a brook the elder brother let the other go first and when he was half way across he gave him such a blow from behind that he fell down dead he buried him beneath the bridge took the boar and carried it to the king pretending that he had killed it whereupon he obtained the king's daughter in marriage and when his younger brother did not come back he said the boar must have killed him and every one believed it but as nothing remains hidden from god so this black deed also was to come to light years afterwards a shepherd was driving his herd across the bridge and saw lying in the sand beneath a snow-white little bone he thought that it would make a good mouthpiece so he clambered down picked it up and cut out of it a mouthpiece for his horn but when he blew through it for the first time to his great astonishment the bone began of its own accord to sing ah friend thou blowest upon my bone long have i lain beside the water my brother slew me for the poor and took for his wife the king's young daughter what a wonderful horn said the shepherd it sings by itself i must take it to my lord the king and when he came with it to the king the horn again began to sing its little song the king understood it all and caused the ground below the bridge to be dug up and then the whole skeleton of the murdered man came to light the wicked brother could not deny the deed and was sewn up in a sack and drowned but the bones of the murdered man were laid to rest in a beautiful tomb in the churchyard end of story 28 Story 29 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roktai. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Devil with the Three Golden Hairs. There was once a poor woman who gave birth to a little son, and as he came into the world with a call on, it was predicted that in his fourteenth year he would have the king's daughter for his wife. It happened that soon afterwards the king came into the village, and no one knew that he was the king, and when he asked the people what news there was, they answered, A child has just been born with a call on. Whatever any one so born undertakes turns out well. It is prophesied, too, that in his fourteenth year he will have the king's daughter for his wife. The king, who had a bad heart and was angry about the prophecy, went to the parents and, seeming quite friendly, said, You poor people, let me have your child and I will take care of it. At first they refused. But when the stranger offered them a large amount of gold for it, and they thought, it is a luck child, and everything must turn out well for it, they at last consented and gave him the child. The king put it in a box and rode away with it until he came to a deep piece of water. Then he threw the box into it and thought, I have freed my daughter 
from her unlooked-for suitor. The box, however, did not sink, but floated like a boat, and not a drop of water made its way into it. And it floated to within two miles of the king's chief city, where there was a mill, and it came to a standstill at the mill dam. A miller's boy, who by good luck was standing there, noticed it and pulled it out with a hook, thinking that he had found a great treasure. But when he opened it, there lay a pretty boy inside, quite fresh and lively. He took him to the miller and his wife, and as they had no children, they were glad and said, God has given him to us. They took great care of the foundling, and he grew up in all goodness. It happened that once in a storm the king went into the mill, and he asked the mill folk if the tall youth was their son. No, answered they, he is a foundling. Fourteen years ago he floated down to the mill dam in the box, and the mill boy pulled him out of the water. Then the king knew that it was none other than the luck child which he had thrown into the water, and he said, My good people, could not the youth take a letter to the queen? I will give him two gold pieces as a reward. Just as the king commands, answered they, and they told the boy to hold himself in readiness. Then the king wrote a letter to the queen, wherein he said, As soon as the boy arrives with this letter, let him be killed and buried, and all must be done before I come home. The boy set out with this letter, but he lost his way, and in the evening came to a large forest. In the darkness he saw a small light. He went towards it and reached a cottage. When he went in, an old woman was sitting by the fire quite alone. She started when she saw the boy and said, Whence do you come, and whither are you going? I come from the mill, he answered, and wish to go to the queen, to whom I am taking a letter. But as I have lost my way in the forest, I should like to stay here overnight. You poor boy, said the woman, you have come into a den of thieves and when they come home they will kill you. Let them come, said the boy. I am not afraid, but I am so tired that I cannot go any farther. And he stretched himself upon a bench and fell asleep. Soon afterwards the robbers came and angrily asked what strange boy was lying there. Ah, said the old woman, it is an innocent child who has lost himself in the forest, and out of pity I have let him come in. He has to take a letter to the queen. The robbers opened the letter and read it, and in it was written that the boy, as soon as he arrived, should be put to death. Then the hard-hearted robbers felt pity, and their leader tore up the letter and wrote another, saying that as soon as the boy came, he should be married at once to the king's daughter. Then they let him lie quietly on the bench until the next morning, and when he awoke they gave him the letter and showed him the right way. And the queen, when she had received the letter and read it, did as was written in it, and had a splendid wedding feast prepared. And the king's daughter was married to the luck child, and as the youth was handsome and agreeable, she lived with him in joy and contentment. After some time the king returned to his palace and saw that the prophecy was fulfilled, and the luck child married to his daughter. How has that come to pass? said he. I gave quite another order in my letter. So the queen gave him the letter and said that he might see for himself what was written in it. The king read the letter and saw quite well that it had been exchanged for the other. He asked the youth what had become of the letter entrusted to him, and why he had brought another instead of it. I know nothing about it, answered he. It must have been changed in the night when I slept in the forest. The king said in a passion, You shall not have everything quite so much your own way. Whosoever marries my daughter must fetch me from hell three golden hairs from the head of the devil. Bring me what I want, and you shall keep my daughter. In this way 
the king hoped to be rid of him forever. But the luck child answered, I will fetch the golden hairs. I am not afraid of the devil. Thereupon he took leave of them and began his journey. The road led him to a large town, where the watchman by the gates asked him what his trade was and what he knew. I know everything, answered the luck child. Then you can do us a favor, said the watchman, if you will tell us why our market fountain, which once flowed with wine, has become dry and no longer gives even water. That you shall know, answered he. Only wait until I come back. Then he went farther and came to another town, and there also the gatekeeper asked him what was his trade and what he knew. I know everything, answered he. Then you can do us a favor and tell us why a tree in our town, which once bore golden apples, now does not even put forth leaves. You shall know that, answered he. Only wait until I come back. Then he went on and came to a wide river over which he must go. The ferryman asked him what his trade was and what he knew. I know everything, answered he. Then you can do me a favor, said the ferryman, and tell me why I must always be rowing backwards and forwards and am never set free. You shall know that, answered he. Only wait until I come back. When he had crossed the water, he found the entrance to hell. It was black and sooty within, and the devil was not at home. But his grandmother was sitting in a large armchair. What do you want? said she to him, but she did not look so very wicked. I should like to have three golden hairs from the devil's head, answered he, else I cannot keep my wife. That is a good deal to ask for, said she. If the devil comes home and finds you, it will cost you your life. But as I pity you, I will see if I cannot help you. She changed him into an ant and said, Creep into the folds of my dress. You will be safe there. Yes, answered he, so far so good. But there are three things besides that I want to know. Why a fountain which once flowed with wine has become dry and no longer gives even water. Why a tree which once bore golden apples does not even put forth leaves. And why a ferryman must always be going backwards and forwards and is never set free. Those are difficult questions, answered she. But only be silent and quiet and pay attention to what the devil says when I pull out the three golden hairs. As the evening came on, the devil returned home. No sooner had he entered than he noticed that the air was not pure. I smell man's flesh, said he. All is not right here. Then he pried into every corner and searched, but could not find anything. His grandmother scolded him. It has just been swept, said she, and everything put in order, and now you are upsetting it again. You have always got man's flesh in your nose. Sit down and eat your supper. When he had eaten and drunk, he was tired, and laid his head in his grandmother's lap, and before long he was fast asleep, snoring and breathing heavily. Then the old woman took hold of a golden hair pulled it out and laid it down near her. Ah! cried the devil. What are you doing? I have had a bad dream, answered the grandmother, so I seized hold of your hair. What did you dream then? said the devil. I dreamed that a fountain in a marketplace from which wine once flowed was dried up and not even water would flow out of it what is the cause of it? Ha, ha! If they did but know it, answered the devil. There is a toad sitting under a stone in the well. If they killed it, the wine would flow again. He went to sleep again and snored until the windows shook. Then 
she pulled the second hair out. Ha! Ah, what are you doing? cried the devil angrily. Do not take it ill, said she. I did it in a dream. What have you dreamt this time? asked he. I dreamt that in a certain kingdom there stood an apple tree which had once borne golden apples, but now would not even bear leaves. What, think you, was the reason? Ah, oh, if they did but know, answered the devil, a mouse is gnawing at the root. If they killed this, they would have golden apples again. But if it gnaws much longer, the tree will wither altogether. But leave me alone with your dreams. If you disturb me in my sleep again, you will get a box on the ear. The grandmother spoke gently to him until he fell asleep again and snored. Then she took hold of the third golden hair and pulled it out. The devil jumped up, roared out, and would have treated her ill if she had not quieted him once more and said, Who can help bad dreams? What was the dream then? asked he and was quite curious. I dreamt of a fairy man who complained that he must always ferry from one side to the other and was never released. What is the cause of it? Ah, uh, the fool, eh? answered the devil. When anyone comes and wants to go across, he must put the oar in his hand, and the other man will have to ferry, and he will be free. As the grandmother had plucked out the three golden hairs, and the three questions were answered, she let the old serpent alone, and he slept until daybreak. When the devil had gone out again, the old woman took the ant out of the folds of her dress, and gave the luck child his human shape again. There are the three golden hairs for you, said she. For the devil said to your three questions, I suppose you hurt. Yes, answered he, I heard, and I will take care to remember. You have what you want, said she, and now you can go your way. He thanked the old woman for helping him in his need, and left hell well content that everything had turned out so fortunately. When he came to the ferryman, he was expected to give the promised answer. Ferry me across first, said the luck child and then I will tell you how you can be set free. And when he reached the opposite shore, he gave him the devil's advice. Next time anyone comes who wants to be ferried over, just put the oar in his hand. He went on and came to the town wherein stood the unfruitful tree, and there too the watchman wanted an answer. So he told him what he had heard from the devil. Kill the mouse which is gnawing at its root and it will again bear golden apples. Then the watchman thanked him and gave him as a reward two asses laden with gold, which followed him. At last he came to the town whose well was dry. He told the watchman what the devil had said. A toad is in the well beneath a stone. You must find it and kill it, and the well will again give wine in plenty. The watchman thanked him and also gave him two asses laden with gold. At last the luck child got home to his wife, who was heartily glad to see him again and to hear how well he had prospered in everything. To the king he took what he had asked for, the devil's three golden hairs, and when the king saw the four asses laden with gold, he was quite content and said, now all the conditions are fulfilled, and you can keep my daughter. But tell me, dear son-in-law, where did all that gold come from? This is tremendous wealth. I was rowed across a river, answered he, and got it there. It lies on the shore instead of sand. 
can i too fetch some of it said the king and he was quite eager about it as much as you like answered he there is a ferryman on the river let him ferry you over and you can fill your sacks on the other side the greedy king set out in all haste and when he came to the river he beckoned to the ferryman to put him across the ferryman came and bade him get in and when they got to the other shore he put the oar in his hand and sprang out but from this time forth the king had to ferry as a punishment for his sins perhaps he is ferrying still if he is it is because no one has taken the oar from him end of story 29「Story 30 of Household Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt The Louse and the Flea A louse and a flea kept house together and were brewing beer in an eggshell. Then the little louse fell in and burnt herself. On this the little flea began to scream loudly. Then said the little room door, Little flea, why art thou screaming? Because the louse has burnt herself. Then the little door began to creak. On this the little broom in the corner said, Why art thou creaking, little door? Have I not reason to creak? The little louse has burnt herself. The little flea is weeping. So the little broom began to sweep frantically. Then a little cart passed by and said, Why art thou sweeping, little broom? Have I not reason to sweep? The little louse has burnt herself. The little flea is weeping. The little door is creaking. So the little cart said, Then I will run, and began to run wildly. Then said the ash heap by which it ran, Why art thou running so, little cart? Have I not reason to run? The little louse has burnt herself. The little flea is weeping. The little door is creaking, the little broom is sweeping. And the ash heap said, Then I will burn furiously, and began to burn in clear flames. A little tree stood near the ash heap and said, Ash heap, why art thou burning? Have I not reason to burn? The little louse has burnt herself, the little flea is weeping, the little door is creaking, the little broom is sweeping, the little cart is running. The little tree said, then I will shake myself, and began to shake herself, so that all her leaves fell off. A girl who came up with her water pitcher saw that, and said, Little tree, why art thou shaking thyself? Have I not reason to shake myself? The little louse has burnt herself, the little flea is weeping, the little door is creaking, the little broom is sweeping, the little cart is running, the little ash heap is burning. On this the girl said, Then I will break my little water pitcher. And she broke her little water pitcher. Then said the little spring from which ran the water, Girl, why art thou breaking thy water jug? Have I not reason to break my water jug? The little louse has burnt herself. The little flea is weeping. The little door is creaking. The little broom is sweeping. The little cart is running. The little ash heap is burning. The little tree is shaking itself. Oh ho, said the spring, then I will begin to flow, and began to flow violently. And in the water everything was drowned, the little girl, the little tree, the little ash heap, the little cart, the broom, the little door, the little flea, the little louse, all together. End of 30。Story 31 of Household Tales this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Girl Without Hands. A certain miller had little by little fallen into poverty, and had nothing left but his mill and a large apple tree behind it. Once, when he had gone into the forest to fetch wood, an old man stepped up to him, whom he had never seen before, and said, 
why dost thou plague thyself with cutting wood i will make thee rich if thou wilt promise me what is standing behind thy mill what can that be but my apple tree thought the miller and said yes and gave a written promise to the stranger he however laughed mockingly and said when three years have passed i will come and carry away what belongs to me and then he went when the miller got home his wife came to meet him and said tell me miller from whence comes this sudden wealth into our house all at once every box and chest was filled no one brought it in and i know not how it happened he answered it comes from a stranger who met me in the forest and promised me great treasure i in return have promised him what stands behind the mill we can very well give him the big apple tree for it oh husband said the terrified wife that must have been the devil he did not mean the apple tree but our daughter who was standing behind the mill sweeping the yard the miller's daughter was a beautiful pious girl and lived through the three years in the fear of god and without sin when therefore the time was over and the day came when the evil one was to fetch her she washed herself clean and made a circle round herself with chalk the devil appeared quite early but he could not come near to her angrily he said to the miller take all water away from her that she may no longer be able to wash herself for otherwise i have no power over her the miller was afraid and did so the next morning the devil came again but she had wept upon her hands and they were quite clean again he could not get near her and furiously said to the miller cut her hands off or else i cannot get the better of her the miller was shocked and answered how could i cut off my own child's hands then the evil one threatened and said if thou dost not do it thou art mine and i will take thee thyself the father became alarmed and promised to obey him so he went to the girl and said my child if i do not cut off both thine hands the devil will carry me away and in my terror i have promised to do it help me in my need and forgive me the harm i do thee she replied dear father do with me what thy will i am your child thereupon she laid down both her hands and let them be cut off the devil came for the third time but she had wept so long and so much on the stumps that after all they were quite clean then he had to give in and had lost all right over her the miller said to her i have by means of thee received such great wealth that i will keep thee most delicately as long as thou livest but she replied here i cannot stay i will go forth compassionate people will give me as much as i require thereupon she caused her maimed arms to be bound to her back and by sunrise she set out on her way and walked the whole day until night fell then she came to a royal garden and by the shimmering of the moon she saw that trees covered with beautiful fruits grew in it but she could not enter for there was much water round it and as she had walked the whole day and not eaten one mouthful and hunger tormented her she thought ah if i were but inside that i might eat of the fruit else i must die of hunger then she knelt down called on god the lord and prayed and suddenly an angel came toward her who made a dam in the water so that the moat became dry and she could walk through it and now she went into the garden and the angel went with her she saw a tree covered with beautiful pears but they were all counted then she went to them and to still her hunger ate one with her mouth from the tree but no more the gardener was watching but as the angel was standing by he was afraid and thought the maiden was a spirit and was silent neither did he dare to cry out or to speak to the spirit when she had eaten the pear 
she was satisfied and went and concealed herself among the bushes the king to whom the garden belonged came down to it the next morning and counted and saw that one of the pears was missing and asked the gardener what had become of it as he was not lying beneath the tree but was gone then answered the gardener last night a spirit came in who had no hands and ate off one of the pears with its mouth the king said how did the spirit get over the water and where did it go after it had eaten the pear the gardener answered some one came in a snow-white garment from heaven who made a dam and kept back the water that the spirit might walk through the moat and as it must have been an angel i was afraid and asked no questions and did not cry out when the spirit had eaten the pear it went back again the king said if it be as thou sayest i will watch with thee to-night when it grew dark the king came into the garden and brought a priest with him who was to speak to the spirit all three seated themselves beneath the tree and watched at midnight the maiden came creeping out of the thicket went to the tree and again ate one pear off it with her mouth and beside her stood the angel in white garments then the priest went out to them and said comest thou from heaven or from earth art thou a spirit or a human being she replied i am no spirit but an unhappy mortal deserted by all but god the king said if thou art forsaken by all the world yet i will not forsake thee he took her with him into his royal palace and as she was so beautiful and good he loved her with all his heart had silver hands made for her and took her to wife after a year the king had to take to the field so he commended his young queen to the care of his mother and said if she is brought to bed take care of her nurse her well and tell me of it at once in a letter then she gave birth to a fine boy so the old mother made haste to write and announce the joyful news to him but the messenger rested by a brook on the way and as he was fatigued by the great distance he fell asleep then came the devil who was always seeking to injure the good queen and exchanged the letter for another in which was written that the queen had brought a monster into the world when the king read the letter he was shocked and much troubled but he wrote in answer that they were to take great care of the queen and nurse her well until his arrival the messenger went back with the letter but rested at the same place and again fell asleep then came the devil once more and put a different letter in his pocket in which was written that they were to put the queen and her child to death the old mother was terribly shocked when she received the letter and could not believe it she wrote back again to the king but received no other answer because each time the devil substituted a false letter and in the last letter it was also written that she was to preserve the queen's tongue and eyes as a token that she had obeyed but the old mother wept to think such innocent blood was to be shed and had a hind brought by night and cut out her tongue and eyes and kept them then said she to the queen i cannot have thee killed as the king commands but here thou mayst stay no longer go forth into the wide world with thy child and never come here again the poor woman tied her child on her back and went away with eyes full of tears she came into a great wild forest and then she fell on her knees and prayed to god and the angel of the lord appeared to her and led her to a little house on which was a sign with the words here all dwell free a snow-white maiden came out of the little house and said welcome lady queen and conducted her inside then they unbound the little boy from her back and held him to her breast that he might feed and laid him in a beautifully made little bed then said the poor woman from whence knowest thou that i was a queen the white maiden answered 
i am an angel sent by god to watch over thee and thy child the queen stayed seven years in the little house and was well cared for and by god's grace because of her piety her hands which had been cut off grew once more at last the king came home again from the war and his first wish was to see his wife and the child then his aged mother began to weep and said thou wicked man why didst thou write to me that i was to take those innocent two lives and she showed him the two letters which the evil one had forged and then continued i did as thou badest me and she showed the tokens the tongue and the eyes then the king began to weep for his poor wife and his little son so much more bitterly than she was doing that the aged mother had compassion on him and said be at peace she still lives i secretly caused a hind to be killed and took these tokens from it but i bound the child to thy wife's back and bade her go forth into the wide world and made her promise never to come back here again because thou wert so angry with her then spoke the king i will go as far as the sky is blue and i will neither eat nor drink until i have found again my dear wife and my child if in the meantime they have not been killed or died of hunger thereupon the king travelled about for seven long years and sought her in every cleft of the rocks and in every cave but he found her not and thought she had died of want during the whole of this time he neither ate nor drank but god supported him at length he came into a great forest and found therein the little house whose sign was here all dwell free then forth came the white maiden and took him by the hand and led him in and said welcome lord king and asked him from whence he came he answered soon i shall have travelled about for the space of seven years and i seek my wife and her child but i cannot find them the angel offered him meat and drink but he did not take anything and only wished to rest a little then he lay down to sleep and put a handkerchief over his face thereupon the angel went into the chamber where the queen sat with her son whom she usually called sorrowful and said to her go out with thy child thy husband hath come so she went to the place where he lay and the handkerchief fell from his face then she said sorrowful pick up thy father's handkerchief and cover his face again the child picked it up and put it over his face again the king in his sleep heard what passed and had pleasure and letting the handkerchief fall once more but the child grew impatient and said dear mother how can i cover my father's face when i have no father in this world i have learned to say the prayer our father which art in heaven thou hast told me that my father was in heaven and was the good god and how can i know a wild man like this he is not my father when the king heard that he got up and asked who they were then she said i am thy wife and that is thy son sorrowful and the king saw her living hands and said my wife had silver hands she answered the good god has caused my natural hands to grow again and the angel went into the inner room and brought the silver hands and showed them to him hereupon he knew for a certainty that it was his dear wife and his dear child and he kissed them and was glad and said a heavy stone has fallen from off mine heart then the angel of the god gave them one meal with her and after that they went home to the king's aged mother there there were great rejoicings everywhere and the king and queen were married again and lived contentedly to their happy end end of story thirty one